we are obviously, uh, well, let me just say that <clears throat> this year should be a merit for the health and success of the families of Regina Bas Yosef Reuven and Yeshaya Ben Israel. Now, this week is the nine days, and um, <clears throat> I think it's uh, sort of like appropriate to talk about the nine days, especially uh, Shabbos, although it's pushed off to Sunday, is what's called the Nitche, is Tisha B'Av. And I think it's worthwhile talking about Tisha B'Av, because Tisha B'Av in many ways uh, illustrates a great deal of our situation, you know, today and previously, obviously since the Chorban. Now, one of the things that we really have to deal with is the concept of relevance of the Chorban. You know, it's very hard to commemorate something that happened, you know, over 2,000 years ago in the year 70 CE, which in a certain sense is, what is it, about 900, uh, 1950 and so on. Uh, so the question then is, what, oh, you know, like I say, it's hard to commemorate that because we ask ourselves, you know, we didn't cause the destruction of the temple, the Beis Hamidosh, so what are we really mourning now, it is true that we do mourn because we have lost it, but we certainly haven't caused that loss, you see. So we would think that maybe the mourning is because, the, and, what, and that, what is the relevance, is that we suffer tremendous loss of the Beis Hamikdash. You know, it's very hard to imagine what the Beis Hamikdash was to the Jewish people at that time, you know, and we certainly don't have anything compared to that type of phenomenon where you actually have a temple, a Beis Hamidosh. And there were many miracles that were going on at that point in time. You see, uh, one of them, for instance, is the smoke on the altar never deviated. It always went up in a perfect vertical, no matter what the weather. I mean, you could have a 70-degree hurricane going to the Jerusalem and the, the uh, column of smoke from the Corbonus went up straight. There were many miracles that happened. For instance, the ashes of the Corbonus that were completely absorbed in the, in the uh, tiles of the Beis Amigdash and so on. Obviously, the biggest thing was that if you were in the temple area, you know, uh, then you could actually feel the Shechina. It was a way of getting in contact with the Shechina, and you could actually feel the tremendous holiness of the place. One of the interesting miracles that took place is that, could you imagine the amount of korbonus, thousands of korbonus, animal sacrifices, bird sacrifices, you know, things were constantly uh, being uh, lit, and consumed or burnt, you know, especially the meat. So you would, you would think that, wait a minute, there must have been an enormous amount of flies because we're not talking about an indoor, you know, butcher shop. We talk about an outdoor, in a certain sense, butcher shop because it was all about basically corbonus. And a great deal of them, obviously, were animals. Yet there was no flies to be seen whatsoever the entire area. Could you imagine? All that meat, all that blood, you know, all the uh, organs and so on, fully exposed to the sun and the entire uh, weather and so on. Yet there's not one fly to be found or maybe even a mosquito, whatever, to be found in any way. It's a mess. Uh, so there clearly were miracles, you know, that took place in the Beis Hamidosh. So <clears throat> that certainly is a phenomenon that doesn't exist today where you could actually see miracles and not only see miracles, you know, you could experience a divine presence. Like I said, we don't have that today. So is this why we mourn? That would make sense because we mourn this, even though it's very hard for us to relate to this type of a situation called the Beis Amigdash, you know. And not only, not only that, but the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash 
meant ultimately the removal of the Shechina, divine presence. So at around that time, prophecy ceased. So could you imagine the greatest spiritual phenomena ever known really is to be a Novi, to be a prophet. Because the concept of prophecy wasn't merely to know the future. It was to know the secrets of the Rabbanu Shalom, you see. And not only that, while you were knowing these ideas, you would experience a tremendous amount of Kedusha. In fact, you would be Dovok, which is attached, connected to the Divine Presence itself. And there was a tremendous feeling of Dvekus, attachment to God, you see. So that ceased at that time, because when the Shrina left, it meant that any phenomenon in which you can become attached to the Shrina, which was really part of the prophetic process, was gone. So certainly that would have meant a tremendous, uh, what do you call it, uh, grief that the Jews experienced. What about, there's also the amount of uh, holiness in general. Could you imagine three times a year, you know, Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot, millions of people would come to the base of Middash. Could you imagine coming into a city where the whole city, millions of people, are celebrating these regolim, you know, these uh, pilgrimage festivals? It would be incredible. Could you imagine, imagine the high that was experienced by the whole Jewish people? It's a whole society experience together an unbelievable amount of holiness. So that certainly is part of what we miss. And therefore that would mean a tremendous relevance for the Jewish people. You know, and we have to remember that the fact that all the, so many millions of Jews converged on the base of Migdash meant a tremendous source of unity for the Jewish people, you see. So here, what are we looking at? The base of Migdash, the miracles of the base of Migdash. One, we're looking at the loss of the presence of God that you could feel if you went to the base of Migdash. Certainly number two, right? Uh, and of course, number three would be the lack of prophecy since the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, left. That was the end of prophecy, basically, which is the greatest spiritual experience a person can ever achieve in this world. You see, so that certainly is missing. Then you had the unity of the Jewish people celebrating en masse a holiday for the entire city of Jerusalem. Could you imagine when the whole city is celebrating the Regolim, those three holidays? And those are the pilgrimage holidays where it was a mitzvah for every male to go up and offer sacrifices. Actually a mitzvah in the Torah and so on. So could you imagine the exhilaration of coming to a city that is completely immersed in the celebration of these three major holidays, you see. <clears throat> and besides that, the Beis HaMikdash offered the Korbanos, it offered the Jew, right, it's number four, it offered the Jew the ability to seek atonement. That's really what the Korbanos were all about, you know, to seek atonement for whatever, the, the, some of the major sins for which there's an obligation, kores, extinction, which is, means to die before the age of 60. So could you imagine it offered a, a Jew a chance to bring korbanos? So to seek, uh, you know, expiation of sin and also to bring shlomim, to celebrate, to give thanks to God and to celebrate, you know, the thank yous that you would offer the Rebbe Shalom, you know, for whatever, successful business, health, all kinds of things, wealth and so on. So that was gone. So we can begin to imagine why Jews would be so grief-stricken because of the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash, you see. <clears throat> but still, it's hard for us to relate to that, you see. So we wonder what's the real relevance 
Because it's one thing to have lived then, and then the base of English was destroyed. Right? But we, we've never experienced any of this. So we ask ourselves, what is the relevance then of the destruction of the temple? You see. And the idea is a very interesting idea. It's really a Gemara to you, Shalmi. Very important idea. That the destruction of the temple has incredible relevance to us. What is that? There's a Gemara that says, any generation, cold door, any generation, that the Beis English was not built in its day, it's as if it was destroyed in its day. That's what the Gemara says. Now that's an incredible Gemara when you think about that. Uh, so therefore, if Tisha B'Av comes and the Beis Amigdash is not built, then what that means is not just that it's not built. It means that the reason why it's not built is because it has been decreed to be destroyed. And if it isn't destroyed because it doesn't exist, right, then it cannot be built. That's the equivalent decree, or zero, you see. In other words, what that really means is that basically in the nine days, there's dinam, there's judgments, you see. <clears throat> and one of the things that, you know, if, uh, the Jews are judged is, do we deserve to have the Beis Amigdash built? Yes, that goes on every year because God really wants the building of the Beis Amigdash so he can be close to his children, the Jewish people. So every nine days of every year, there's a tremendous judgment in heaven. Do the Jews of that generation, do they deserve to have the Beis Hamikdash built? And since there's a judgment, obviously there has to be a verdict. So if the verdict is that they don't deserve to have the Beis Hamikdash built, because they have sinned tremendously, so therefore the generation does not deserve to have the Beis Hamikdash, <clears throat> then that's equivalent to it being destroyed. In other words, if it was existing, then that decree that they don't deserve to have it would mean that it would be destroyed. And that's what exactly happened in 70 CE. It was destroyed because they did not deserve to have it. But what about in our generation? So the decree is the same. If it was existing, it would be destroyed, because we don't deserve to have it. Our sins are too numerous. But since it doesn't exist, since it doesn't exist, right? So then what the decree really is, is not that it's going to be destroyed, but it cannot be rebuilt you think about that, that's an incredible idea. You see, that it cannot be built. And there you are. That's the relevance. Because it means that the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed then, right, in 70 CE. That's true. But it was, but it, and it was destroyed because of their sins, whatever it was, which actually, according to Chazal, is sin as chinam, is baseless hatred. Obviously, and the Jews have suffered from sinas chinam, which is baseless or groundless hatred, hatred for thousands of years. It's one of the great um, disabilities of the Jews. There's always so much jealousy and hatred, especially according to the Chavetz Chaim, Lashen Hora, and the Masha, Lashen Hora, because of the sinas chinam, the baseless hatred, there's a tremendous amount of Lashen Hora that was spoken and the Marsha and the Chofi Chaim both say that that's why it was really destroyed, because of the tremendous Russian horror. But in any case, therefore it was destroyed in that generation, because they did not deserve to have it. We destroyed it also, you see, and therefore it cannot be built. It's not destroyed because it doesn't exist. So the decree is, or the verdict is, it cannot be built. But it's the same concept. The reason why it cannot be built is because we destroyed it. Same idea. You see, we destroyed it because basically, 
Sinas Chinam. We don't realize how much Sinas Chinam there is among the Jewish people. There are many streams of Judaism, legitimate streams. I'm not even going to the amount of people that are gone, you know, intermarried, unaffiliated, uh, assimilated, and so on. I'm going into the, even the religious, it's a tremendous amount of arrogance, Sinas Chinam. One group hates another group because they're, they're not the same. They don't have the same, you know, uh, homeless stringencies and so on. So therefore, because of the Sinas Chinam, the Beis Hamikdash is destroyed in the form of not being built. There you are. That's the relevance, the real relevance that we have toward the Beis Hamikdash. We caused the Beis Hamikdash to be absent in the form of the fact that it cannot be built, which is exactly equal to what they did, but since the Beis Hamikdash was standing, it was destroyed. So that's something to think about, <clears throat> that we all have a share in the fact that the Beis Hamikdash does not exist today. Very important idea. So that's the first concept that I'd like to share with everybody. That is our relevance to the Beis HaMikdash, obviously, because we do not have those phenomenon that used to be in the Beis HaMikdash. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> one of the things which is really very interesting, very important, is when the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, left which it did, obviously. And once the Shekhinah leaves, then permission is granted to the Goyim, to the Romans, to destroy the Beis HaMikdash. And of course, the first Beis HaMikdash was the Babylonians. But they cannot, they cannot destroy the Beis HaMikdash unless the Divine Presence leaves, which signals to them and allows them to destroy the Beis HaMikdash. You see, so, the question that we can ask is, where does God go? What does it mean the Shekhin left? You know, we know God fills the universe, you see. But what it does mean is that the divine presence of what we can experience at that place is gone. It's as if God left, you see. Even though we know He fills the entire creation with His presence, right? Uh, as it, we, we know. But what it means is that in certain select places, God allows His presence to be felt by a person. And that's what He took away. No longer would you feel the Beis HaMikdash, you see. But that's the concept of Him leaving. Where did He go? Well, what is interesting is that in the Dvaram, at the end, it says, V'shov Hashem Eshvoscho and God will return your captivity. Now Rashi points out, wait a minute, it really should say, Veheshev Hashem Eshvoscho, and God will turn around your captivity, which means that He will bring you back. So the verb should be Veheshev, right? And He will cause to return, right? Uh, your captivity, or He will cause to be overturned your captivity. It doesn't say Vaheshev, it says Vishov, and God will return with your captivity. So from here we learn a very important phenomenon, and this is where God went when the Beis Hamikdash was destroyed, so to speak. <clears throat> it's called Shrinta Bigalusa. The divine presence is in Golas. You see. That means the divine presence itself is in exile. Now, we know, what do you mean divine presence is an exile? I mean, God is omnipotent. You can't place God where you want Him to be. Uh, you cannot compel God. It's obvious. <clears throat> but what God did is He voluntarily allowed Himself to be captured. This is the concept of exile. It's called the Klippa. He allowed the satanic forces you see to be unique to nourish from the divine presence itself 
the tremendous awe, sparks of holiness, is now being taken by the satanic forces, the sudden, and so on. And they derive enormous power. <clears throat> That's what Shrinta Bigalusa really means, that the Divine Presence is in exile. <clears throat> now what exile basically means is you are not in a position to exert your potential at all. You are not in a position, right, <clears throat> where you can be independent. In, on the contrary, you are in a position, you're exiled, you see, you're in a position where you are compelled and dependent on another being or force. So that's where the Shekhinah went. It went into what's called the Kripa. It went amongst, as a captive, so to speak, of the uh, satanic forces, that they can nourish off the divine energy, and they could do terrible things to the Jewish people. Now the question is, why did God do that? Well, I had mentioned previously, in a couple of the lectures before, you see, that the Sutton has a self-interest he needs the energy of the divine presence to survive. So when God allowed him to, uh, to, to sudden that is, to take from him, from the divine presence, that apparently satisfies the sudden. So he doesn't claim that the Jews should be destroyed. You see, he's too busy nourishing of the divine presence. So in other words, what, the reason why God allows himself, so to speak, to be a captive, even if it's voluntary, is to allow the sudden to minimize his kitrugim, his prosecutions, because he is now not only surviving, but he is flourishing. And that's what the sudden wants, really. You see, he wants the divine energy. So the sudden, therefore, diminishes his kitrugim, his prosecutions and that allows the Jews to survive you see so that is why the the, the uh, Shechina goes into Golas, goes into exile in order to allow the Jews to survive you see but remember that's where he is and we now understand a Pasuk it says that even if you are exiles and I've quoted this many times that even if your exiles are where, in the, out, in the heavens, at the end of heaven, so Misham, from there, God will gather you. Right? What do you mean from there? That means he will go into the ends of heaven, which is the Golas. That is what the Golas is. We are at the ends of heaven. So God will go into the, ex the uh, Golas itself, the exile, and take the Jews out. But we now understand something much more profound. What do you mean he will go into the exile, the Golas itself? The real concept is that that's where he is. That's why from there he will gather you and he will take you to him and then bring to you to Israel. Because he's there with you. So obviously he can gather you there, right, into the nations of the world, because that's exactly where he is. It's a, it's a different way of understanding. So that Pasuk is really a tremendous illusion that God is together with the Jews in Golas, in exile. Except the exile of God, so to speak, is different than the exile of the Jews. But in both instances, or both cases, God is, in a certain sense, unable to do certain things, which means that he allows the sudden to nourish off the divine presence. And therefore, God secludes himself, or he restricts himself from doing things that he certainly can do, because he's omnipotent. So you're looking at God who practices a tremendous restriction on his potential. That's exactly what happened to the Jews. The Jews practice a tremendous amount of, or this is what's done to them, of restriction of their potential. The Jew cannot be what he really is. That's the concept of exile. That the Jew is exiled from himself. Exile is not just a place 
all of a sudden you move out of your home. No. What exile is, is the inability, right, to completely realize your potential. You are trapped. You are restricted. It's almost like you're a prisoner, you see, and you can't be what you could be. So that is both God and the Jewish people. That's what the concept of exile really is. is where a being restricts his ability to do what he can do, to be what he can be. That's the real concept of Golos, of the, of the exile. And both the Jewish people and the Shechina, in a certain sense, it, go through that phenomenon called exile. You see, so that Pasuk in its sudden, and from there he will gather you, is really alludes to the fact that God is with you at the ends of heaven in order to protect the Jews and allow them to survive. Very important concept. That's where God really is. And that's where the Shekhinah is. Now, therefore, what we see is something which is really very interesting. You see, <clears throat> um, if you think about it, you know, God exiles himself from the divine presence. So it's interesting, it's worthwhile looking, you see, at where God exiled himself. So, at first, where is the base of Mikdash? <clears throat> so the first base of Mikdash, obviously, is the Mishkan, the tabernacle. That was the first base Hamikdash, you see. Then, from the Mishkan, right, God went to the first temple, first base of Mikdash, in the time of Shlomo Melech. Right? So that's the second time that God is now amongst the Jews in terms of the first base of Mikdash. But that was destroyed. So God before moved from the Mishkan to the first base of Mikdash. And now the first base of Mikdash is destroyed. So he, now he moves and waits, right, for the second base of Mikdash in the time of Ezra, you see. So all of these are exile phases of the Shekhinah, of the Divine Presence. But where is God now? We obviously don't have the first base of Migdash of Shlomo, or Melech. We don't have the second base of Migdash of Ezra, right? So where is he? So what God does is very interesting. Because there must be a place that he is, you see. And where God is now is the Kosel, Right? the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall, the Kaisal Maravi. And it's interesting that God moved from the Kodesh Kedoshim, and in the middle of the Kodesh Kedoshim was the Evan Shasir, that rock, which from there God created the entire creation, actually, certainly the universe. So God moved from the Kodesh Kedoshim, which is where the present-day mosque is, and he moved to the Kaisal, which is the outer extremity or boundary of the place of the temple you see where it used to be so the, if you ask yourself where is the Shechina today the Shechina is in Golis and the indicator of that is that the Shechina is by the Kosel which is right at the edge the outer boundary of the second Beis Hamikdash. so the Kosel is actually today what is called the Mokam Mikdash that's where he is, exactly. So if you go to the Kosel, you see, and you are even on a, a, a minimum spiritual level, you will feel a presence, right? Many people say that. When you go to the Wailing Wall, Kosel Maravi, Western Wall, you can actually feel something. There's something there that is different. So that's where God is. You see, and the the Rebbeinu, as I mentioned quite a while ago, he will return with the third base amigdash. And I had mentioned what that is, that corresponding or parallel to the th to the second base amigdash was the base amigdash, the Milo, above, just like there's a Jerusalem above that parallels the Jerusalem below. There's a base amigdash above, you know, in Yitzira, the world of formation, which is, which is the residence of the angels, 
right? There's a base amygdala still also that parallels, right, the second base amygdala, the Mata. So when God come, build, rebuilds the third base amygdala, it will not be the same as the second or the first or even the Mishkan. What God will do is bring down that base amygdala in heaven. He will physicalize that base amygdala and that base amygdala will descend which is awesome. Why? Because God, in an unbelievable degree of holiness, resides on that Beis Hamikdash in heaven. You see, so when that third Beis Hamikdash, which and that what it's what it's going to be, when that descends, then God, at His degree of almost insight, infinite, will descend with it, because that's His residence. And therefore, we are going to experience the degree of God's presence as it is in the Beis Hamikdash above. We will experience that in the Beis Hamikdash below. And that is the Messianic Beis Hamikdash, which is unbelievable. Because that is the Beis Hamikdash of Olim Yitzirah that will descend to Olim Asiyah, which is our physical world, basically. <clears throat> And therefore, the amount of illumination or enlightenment, consciousness, will be awesome. And that's what it means that Mola or its Deo, you see, that the world will be filled with the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God, what knowledge? Not the knowledge that we glean here, or even at the level of prophecy, when prophecy existed. It will be the knowledge of God as He manifests Himself in Olam Yetzirah, you see, in that world, which will be absolutely awesome. And that, by the way, is the Messianic light. Yes, that's the Orishan, or the Omishiach, you see. And this gives us the understanding of what is the Messianic light. It is really the divine presence of the Beis Hamikdash above that now becomes physicalized as the Beis Hamikdash here, but that presence, the degree of that presence, is so awesome, you see, that it spills out into the entire planet, and that becomes messianic light. And the amount of enlightenment, actually Torah, that will be uh, present among the Jewish people will be beyond belief. And I once brought a medrash that says that the entire Torah of Moshe Rabbeinu, you know, the Talmuds, Bavli, Yushami, Sifro, Sifrei, Mechilto, right, all the medrashim, all the uh, responsa, Shilas, the from Tanakh, everything, right? All of this, the medrash says, at the end of Kohelas, is Hevel, is nothing more than air. It has no substance when you compare it to the Torah of the Messiah, the Mashiach. That is the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God as the water covers the seabed. That's the Torah itself. In, in other words, the Torah of the Mashiach, which is that ore that comes from the divine presence of the third base Amigdash, that is so awesome, right, that... The Torah of Moshe Rabbeinu, which is really all the Torah we have, is as zero compared to the Torah of the Mashiach. So could you imagine what that would mean? We, we have no inkling of what even that refers to. And then it says that the Torah of Mashiach is nothing compared to the Torah of Ilm Habo, the future world. You see, and that's all because the level of being changes, right? Remember, the Messianic era is really the equivalent of Adam Horishan, the first man, right? Before the sin. That's really what we return to in the Messianic era, you see. So that's man in an unbelievable state. Specifically, there's no Zoyamo. There's no pollution of the sudden. And therefore, the amount of divine presence will be something which we cannot even begin to calculate. 
But what's interesting is that's the era of the Messiah, which is equivalent to Adam Harishim, the first man, right? Before the sin, when there was no Zoyamo, pollution of the Sultan, that enveloped, pervaded the physical universe. But when you think about it, <clears throat> which I had mentioned, I think, previously or whatever, is that the nature of our being in the future world is called, what we call, is really the greatest type or degree of being at all, you see, because it's the, what's called the perfect zulosoi. It's the God created an other, and that other is the neshama. But in the world of the neshama, right, then what the, uh, the, the, the uh, Torah will be, you know, is the knowledge of God, will be the equivalent or appropriate for a being that has no Geshem. He, the Neshama will not have any real uh, substantial physicality. It certainly doesn't have a sudden because he was destroyed. It's not even real Ruchni, it's spiritual. Because the Neshama is much greater in being than the angels. So, Ulam Habu is a world in which there's no pollution of the Sultan that's gone. There's no Geshem, basically, that's also basically gone. Although, although the Ramchal says there's a, a presence of physicality, but it's not the same, same physicality that we know. It's almost completely bottled, which is canceled, negated to the Neshama. But the amount of consciousness will be something we cannot even begin to imagine because it will be experienced by the Neshama itself, you see. But in any case, getting back to the uh, future redemption, all of this will happen at the future redemption, which is actually, I mean, when you think about it, it's completely staggering, <clears throat> you see. Now, we can affect the presence of God. You know, and it was affected how we can experience it. Now, before the sin of the golden calf, which happened obviously, you know, after the um, the re uh, redemption from Egypt, there's a pasuk that says, "V'shochanti b'seichom." God says, "We osulu midgush, and they will build me a temple, and I will dwell in their midst." Because what God really wanted is to dwell in the midst, in the midst of the neshama of the Jewish people. You see, you know, it's God enters creation through the neshama. You see, that's how He enters. The neshama is a portal of the divine presence, and that's not only does God enter the world through the divine presence, but we experience God internally. We don't have to go to a Beis Hamikdash, really, to experience God at all. You know, we just close our eyes, sit down, think, and all of a sudden we actually feel the presence of God, which is basically what a prophet will feel. You see, a Novi will feel the presence without having to, to go to the Beis Hamikdash. That was originally intended for all Jews, that God would enter the universe or the creation through the neshama and each Jew would experience God from his neshama, you see. So it's only because of the chet ego, of the sin of the golden calf, that God said, no, I am now going to remove myself. But the God didn't remove himself from coming into creation. That still exists. But if you want to experience God, even though he enters through your soul, right, you need to go outside of yourself to a Beis HaMikdash. And that's really where you experience God, at the Beis HaMikdash. But the original intent was not that the Beis HaMikdash or the Mishkan, whatever, would be a place that you need to go, right, uh, uh, to experience God. No, you experience God from within. But after the golden calf sin, and the Beis HaMikdash became the place to experience God, you see. The entry of God was into your neshama, but the experiencing of God was the Beis HaMikdash itself, unfortunately, you see. So really the Beis HaMikdash, in a certain sense, not in terms of what it can function as, right, was not supposed to be 
where you experience God. You're supposed to experience God from within, within your soul, you see. But because of the sin of the golden calf, the Beis Hamikdash now became not only a central meeting area, you know, for all the Jews to get together and experience the joy of those holidays in unity with all the Jewish people. See, that's what it was supposed to be originally, but now it has become the place to experience God all because of the golden calf. So there's a tremendous difference now uh, in terms of experience God, you see. So we now understand many things about uh, Tisha B'Av. We, we understand the loss, you see, and the real loss is that we caused the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash. You see, <clears throat> now there are ma- many ideas. You see, and I mentioned the central idea of exile is not that we are removed from our place. You see, well, we're no longer in Israel. We are removed from what we could be. Our potential is blocked. It's restricted. That's the real exile. It's the exile of the self from where it could be. And that's exactly, as I mentioned, what God is. He has exiled himself and does not reveal himself, right? And not only that, but he allows the Satan to capture him in a certain sense and to take from the tremendous amount of holiness, you see. And that is why we don't have the potential, you know. In fact, the Gemara even says, you know, that one of the ideas is that there were Tamidim, 80 Tamidim of Hillel, and many of them were so great that they could, they could experience a divine revelation like Moshe Rabbeinu. Or they could stop the sun like Yeshua ben Nun. He stopped the sun in one of the wars. That's how great they were. But why didn't it happen? And the answer to that is because they were blocked. Their potential was blocked because the, 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 the Jews are in exile, which means they cannot be what they can be, you know, <clears throat> uh, and that's unfortunate. You know, I remember that the, there were ads for the army, U.S. Army, and one of the ways they were trying to convince you to join was an advertisement that said, be all you can be, you see, and that exactly is when the Jews will be redeemed. They will be all they can be, no restrictions, no blockage, that's exactly what they will be. So it's interesting that uh, the U.S. Army took on or the understanding exactly of what the exile really is when you cannot be all you can be, you see? So that's what's happening, you see. So we now understand something very important. What is going on today? Today, we are in terrible moral decay, terrible darkness, you see. And there's so, much, there's so much darkness around, it's even hard to believe. So that tells us something very interesting. There are people that, that have asked me, for instance, well, what's our Avedo? In such darkness and Klippo and Zoyama, well, what are we supposed to do? So there's a very interesting phrase. It's called Sumira, turn away from evil, and I say Toiv, and, and do good. You see, those are two focuses. One is to turn away from evil, which is don't allow the Zoyam of the Sultan, don't allow satanic forces to influence you in so many different ways where your focus now becomes power, pleasure, you see, uh, the illusion of self-aggrandizement, you see, uh, and, and fame. These are all illusory so turn away from that. And on the contrary, asetoiv, which means strive for spirituality, strive for righteousness, holiness, you see. <clears throat> so it's interesting, and this answers a very interesting question. You know, today, right before the Mashiach comes, the Zoyamo is enormously intensified. The satanic forces, the power of the Satan, is incredibly intensified as we see what's happening in the entire world. The amount of evil here is, is beyond belief. 
the amount of rebellion against God, the anti-Semitism, you know, the immorality, the decay, the depravity, you know, the, the greed, you know, the evil that is perpetrated on mankind, from mankind, is, it's hard to believe that mankind has descended to the, the level of animals. And this all happens, obviously, at the end. And I mentioned in previous shurim, because justice has to be satisfied, you see. So I, there was always an interesting phenomenon. And that phenomenon is that we find that a great deal of the lectures given, you know, and a great deal of this forum, if you go into a Jewish bookstore, it used to be that the major section was the Jewish section, the Torah section, you know, where the Sfarim were. Today, you walk into a Jewish bookstore, right, and the, the table, which is in the front, trying to get you to buy these books, it's all about stories. It's like people have nothing else to say. There's no more ideas of Torah. The real things that the Jewish bookstores sell is about stories that try to inspire you, right? One story after another. In fact, most speakers today always will tell you a story. Whatever happened to the concepts of Judaism, the hashkafa, you know, the ideas, the depths of the concepts itself of how God runs the world, you see? You don't have that anymore, basically. You basically have stories. The question is why? Why has the focus of Jewish literature, you know, to try to change people and help them become more righteous, why is it all about stories? Now, I'm not in any way diminishing the power of a story. Don't get me wrong, you know. But you have books all about stories. The whole book is a storybook, you see. And uh, it's just astounding when you go into a Jewish bookstore to realize that the overwhelming amount of books that are in the front of the store is ba basically all about, you know, like I say, stories. Whatever happened to the Jewish thinking ability of the concepts which used to be so prevalent in the olden days? And the answer in many ways is very interesting because since the Avoida, the main work today is don't fall into the hands of the Sultan. It's not about becoming more and more righteous. You see, that is true, you know, in a generation that is not as dark or as evil. So, you see, so it's much easier to, reserve, to preserve yourself with righteousness. So, therefore, you can betake yourself to the concepts and the hashkof of Judaism and drush and so on. But in a generation where the, there's such an intensification of zoyamo, of evil and depravity, right, then the major avoider today is not asay toiv, it's sumira, stay away from evil. In other words, you have to do anything you can to survive. You see, it's like somebody who fell into a pool and can't swim. So his concern isn't to swim because he can't. His concern is not to drown. So he holds on to a life raft so he doesn't drown. That's Sumira. Survive. Struggle to survive. Just don't drown. And therefore, what's very effective with that is stories. Because they inspire when you read stories about God's intervention in mankind, stories about Sadiqim and how they conducted themselves, then you have this tremendous inspiration to want to avoid evil, even if the stories are not about the Torah itself, but it is about the practice of the mitzvahs, it is about the practice of becoming righteous, holy, and, and so on. Therefore, in a generation like that, Christ will has to turn its focus not to the concepts of Hashkofa, you see, or the depths of ideas in Judaism. No. It has to have stories, you see, to inspire people to refrain from doing evil, try to remain righteous. And that, at least for me, it answers the question of why so much of the literature coming out today is all about what's called Maisim. Stories you see, uh, uh, you know, anecdotes about tzaddikim, about people and their interaction with God, 
or the Hashgoch of Pratis, Shaita Deshmaya, etc. You see, and that really is what is today. So if you want to mourn Tisha B'Av, you can mourn this. We are in a terrible situation. We are in incredible darkness. You see, tremendous intensity, like I say, of satanic forces. Wherever you turn, you see unbelievable, like I say, depravity, immorality, you know. Uh, and you can't even believe what the world has become. It's almost, it's insane. It's irrational, uh, you know, in terms of what the world is turning into, <clears throat> you see. And that is the end. So what Tisha B'Av is to us is terrible. It's no longer about, well, I'm not, I'm not uh, learning Torah enough. I have not ma- mastered the oral law. I have not mastered Shas and Shulchan Aruch and so on. That's what's called the mastery of scholarship of the Torah. That used to be the main goal. Today the main goal is what? Is don't drown. Don't fall into the evil and be influenced by this incredible evil culture that abounds in America, in Israel, and, and, and so on, and in Europe. That's what today is. So Tisha B'Av is no longer just, well, I'm not as holy and righteous. I'm not a Talmud Chochem, what I'd love to be. No, no, no. Forget about that. You know, you have to thank God that you're not as evil as a generation. Uh, you know, that you are, you daven every day, you have kids that you send to yeshiva, you see, and you try to survive, you try to avoid the internet, right? Or you try to avoid the enormous amount of batola that goes on, the enormous amount of wasted time that goes on. That's our Tisha B'Av today, you see. The Tisha B'Av of the old days was much greater, or was much, wasn't as bad as today. Because that Tisha B'Av was where a person would say, well, why am I not a scholar? Why am I not a tremendous Talmud Chochem? Obviously because the Divine Presence is gone. Today, it's not just that the Divine Presence is gone. It is, the world is saturated with satanic forces, satanic influence. It's much worse. It's a much greater Tisha B'Av. And again, it's all because the Divine Presence is gone. It's something to really think about. Our Tisha B'Av is much worse than the Tisha B'Av of earlier generations, you see. Because, like I say, you know, they bemoan the fact that they were not as great scholars as they would like to be. They weren't as righteous. You know, they were not Sadiqim, Kedoshim, and so on. We... We're so far removed from that. Our Tisha B'Av is that, you know, we are, thank God that we are not as evil as everybody else. We're not as depraved, immoral, you see, or ruthless or whatever. That's our Tisha B'Av, you know. <clears throat> we have to thank God we don't drown, you know. Forget about that we're not tremendous Torah scholars. A different type of Tisha B'Av. So I believe that's something really to think about. And God has obviously helped us by allowing people, and they don't, they don't even realize why everybody's into stories. And the answer to that, like I said, is because when you want to avoid becoming evil and becoming contaminated with depravity and so on, then you need stories, right? You need inspiration, that's what you need. And therefore, what God has done is change the mindset of an enormous amount of Jews who lecture. And they lecture about stories. Now you understand why this has come about. Because we are now in the avoid of Sumira. We are in the work of avoiding evil. You know? And for those lucky enough who also excel in Torah scholarship, that's tremendous. Thank God for that. But most people are gone. You know, this is the incredible thing, that they're gone because of assimilation, intermarriage. They're unaffiliated. There's so many Jews that don't even know they're Jews. Or a person may know he's Jewish, but he has no connection to it whatsoever. There are millions of Jews. I mentioned that there was a study done in London that estimates there's 15.1 million Jews. 
right? And only 2.1 million are Haredim. It doesn't mean necessarily the political party. It means that they are Torah observant. That means 13 million Jews are gone. So their avoider isn't to become a Talmud Chacham. Their avoider is to try to avoid becoming, you know, corrupt, evil, depraved, immoral, you see. And that's really in many ways the avoider of the Haredim, of the people who are Torah observant. And that's why all of a sudden the lectures of you know, of Jewish thought and so on, have turned to stories. I don't even know if they realize why. Probably not. But that's why you walk into a Jewish bookstore and there was all the books there in the front desks and so on. It's all about Meissam stories. In any case, our Tishabov is much worse than the Tishabov earlier, especially because of the climate of evil that pervades this planet the insanity and remember because this generation is involved in this parikas oil to overthrow the yoke we are really the equivalent of what we are the equivalent of the door Hamidbo, right where in those days they wanted a war with god overthrow god and they want to supplant god in other words they say to themselves well our morals is what count. We want to do whatever we want. We don't want to listen to God. He's not the boss. And they had that tremendous enmity to God to such an extent where the generation of the Tower of Babel actually wanted to build a tower to overthrow God. It's incredible. Guess what? We are at the exact same point. Mankind wants to overthrow God by allowing himself every perversion, every distortion, every evil and sin that they can do and get away with. We are in the generation of the Tower of Babel. So we await an awakening, you see. We await awakening just the Tower of Babel came who? Came Avram Avinu. That was the beginning of the end. Oh, so it's important to remember we are not grieving in the same way that they grieved hundreds of years ago. We are trying to thank God that we are not as evil and as crazy as the generation itself. Something worthwhile thinking. That's how low mankind has sunk. Any case, uh, I hope that I have spoken ideas which are really worthwhile thinking about, you know, and to think about stay holy Try not to sink into the quicksand, because that's where everybody's sinking. You know, forget about trying to get out of the quicksand. Just don't sink. You see, stay with God, and that's in the end the main thing. Remain on His team. You see, and I mentioned, and I'll end with this, is that when Moshe Rabbeinu, when the Jews sinned at the Golden Calf, Moshe Rabbeinu said, "Me Hashem." A lie. Who is with God? Come to me. It's interesting. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't even mention the golden calf because the essential thing that God wants is not only to do the mitzvahs, because we will all sin. It says, "Ain't tzaddik yechta." There's no such thing as a righteous person that doesn't sin. But what God, what God wants from us essentially, and this is what Rabbi Avram ben David, the Ravad the one who argues with the Rambam all the time, that what God wants is, are you on his team? Are you part of his club? Of course there are rules. And everybody's going to violate some rules. But the question is, who are you dedicated to? Who are you devoted to? Are you on God's team? Are you with God? Then come to Mishra Benyam. That's the Avedah of Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Whatever you do, don't sink which means don't join the other team, the Tower of Babel team. That's who the opposition is. Don't join them. Whatever you can do, stay with God. Do whatever you can, right? Don't sink into the quicksand. You see, even if you can't move and get out of the quicksand, because that's how much darkness there is. And if you can do that, then your reward will be beyond comprehension. 
Because the greater the darkness is the greater the struggle, you see. And in today's generation, we struggle with an enormous amount of difficulty. And therefore, like the, the, the original Rebbe once said, you know, he said that the reward in the end of time, if you will stay with God and not fall into the quicksand, right, then that reward, according to what he says, which is astounding, will be greater than the Akedah Yitzchak. It is greater than the reward that Avraham Avinu and Yitzchak received because of the binding of Isaac, the Akedah Yitzchak. And the answer to that, of course, is because of the darkness and the enormous difficulty staying holy and being on the team of God. So let's hope that uh, certainly Moitzoy Shriyas, when the Gemara says that Mashiach ben David arrives, what we're hoping is that in Moitzoy Shemitah, which is only in, what, three months or two months, whatever, is that the beginning of the Messianic process will begin and all of a sudden there will be an outpouring, the beginning of outpouring of tremendous enlightenment and consciousness. Any questions? Do you feel that um, when Tishrei, when uh, in the month of Tishrei, that's when it's going to start? Because that's when the Yovel starts? Uh, yeah, that's when Shemitah. You know, you mentioned something interesting. We don't know when Yovel is, but we do know that Yovel, which Yovel, uh, we do know that Yovel is the 50th year. And this year was Shemitah, right? That means next year is a candidate to be Yovel. And in Yovel it says, you know, call out freedom throughout the land where everything returns to its previous owners and so on. And that's really what the redemption is. Everything returns to God. And everybody realizes, right, our connection with God. So it's very possible that this Mitzvah Shemitah, this, when Shemitah ends, right, will be a Yovel, could be Yovel. We don't really know. Could you imagine if it really is Yovel? Even though we, we don't have to observe it because the majority of Jews are not in Israel. It's outside Israel. But the main idea is it could be a Yovel. And therefore this year, or right after the year ends, first day of Rosh Hashanah, could very well be the beginning of the turnaround, the beginning of the process of redemption. Because we, we all know that this world gets more and more depraved, dark and evil by, by the day. It's astounding what's happening. And I'm certainly hopeful that God will certainly say, enough is enough. So, you know, that's an interesting idea, the concept of evil possibly being this Rosh Hashanah. Um, when you gave the definition of exile, of um, saying how Hashem restricts His potential and how we're restricted from our potential, is that yes. um, the intention we're supposed to have in um, the Shemona Yisrael <coughs> when it says Ga'al Yisrael, that we was, like when we pray for our own um, redemption from our own galuts that we have in our personal lives? Are we supposed to have that intention of that our own potential is being um, restricted? Yes. What we really want is, you know, you still have to work. But what we want is take the block away. You see? I mean, you know, we find ourselves 24-7 doing what? Struggling. It's like to move an inch in Kedusha and holiness requires an extraordinary effort that never happened before. See, the effort to become a holy person hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, was much easier. Today, you know, you could spend years moving one inch, right? But they used to move one inch in 20 seconds. And we could spend years trying to move one inch. But remember one thing, God does not look at the amount that we move. He looks at the struggle. In fact, that's what it says in the Gemara Brochus. The from Tsaro Agro, the reward that God looks at, which he counts, right, is what? According to the Tsar, the 
pain, the struggle, that's what determines the reward, not the distance that you've covered. Because there's an enormous amount of blockage. God knows that. So really what we want, one of the main things we pray, is that God should remove the blocks, the inability to be what you can be, as I said. We want to leave Gullus. Why? Not so because we can goof off and do nothing. No. We want to leave Gullus not only because, you know, you don't have to work for a living, because everything will come to you with incredible blessing. Yeah, that's nice. But the reason why we want to lose goals is we want the blocks to be removed. And as a result of the removal of the blocks, we can get closer to God. We can become holy, really holy. And that's what the Jewish people are. A tremendous Am Kodesh, a tremendous holy nation. That's what we really want. Unfortunately, a lot of people want the redemption because they have difficulties, you know, whether it be health or divorce or whatever, so they want to be freed from suffering. What we really want to do is get rid of the blocks so we can get closer to God. That's the essence, really, of what we really would love to have. So my question is that if we're really coming up to the, you know, we're at the, the like the end of it, um, because we always say that Tehiyat HaMetim has 210 years worth, and so uh, we're seeing, we're looking at that in 20, in the year 2030. Yeah. So if we have about eight and a half years left before that, why would Hashem even give a deep? Meaning, He always said in the, the 6,000 years of this earth, and and now we know that 210 of those years is towards Tehiyat HaMetim. Mashiach could come any time before. But if, you know, Yaakov Avinu saw when the Mashiach was going to come. And there were so many people throughout history, history who saw, who had that prophecy of when the Mashiach would come. If it's going to come at the hair of it, like at the end, right to the end, because that's where we are right now, we're almost right to the end, why give us that hopeless, like that, you know, it's like a fake hope. An empty hope, like even to have, we, we're always supposed to want it to come every day, yes. But is it really going to come tomorrow? Most likely not. So, you understand know what I mean? Yeah. Well, in a certain sense, uh, he wants to give us this, right? Uh, because he wants to increase our bitochen, which is our faith and our trust in God, which I once mentioned is very critical, you know, to have. Because that's one of the major merits of the redemption. You see, that's why it gets so dark and hopeless before, at the end. Because God wants us to hang in there. And that is incredible merit. That we, we have not left him in that sense. You see. So in, in that sense, you know, uh, that, that's what he wants. But, you know, God does in certain sense light the way. He sends individuals... I always find that interesting. You know, who have special messages. And on the contrary, maybe that's what he wants. Is in a generation where everybody's hopeless, you know, maybe he'll send somebody to sort of like invigorate everybody's imuna. You know, God does not abandon the Jewish people in that sense, you know. Uh, but I would imagine it is to keep them struggling. Or if they give up hope, they have to have some type of hope that there can be some type of redemption, even if they don't know exactly when. So I imagine that's why the Zohar was written. <clears throat> you know, that 210 years is Tres Amesim, Resurrection of the Dead, to give us an authoritative safer that in some way brings some kind of light. You know, uh, it's like a light at the end of the tunnel. You know, so that's probably why he does it. He doesn't want to abandon us to complete hopelessness. There has to be something that will help us see that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. You see. The other question I had was, um, the Kilipa, do they uh, also have um, a hold on the Sefirot? On the what? On the, on the ten Sefirot. No. 
they can only take from the lower seven. Uh huh. They, so, they cannot so take the, the upper. Three. Have a hold on the seven, but not on the top three. Right. That's why in the days of the Sphira, right, we count forty-nine. So it's the lowest seven of seven, because the ones that count, the main ones, is the ten sfirot, and then the and then the sub sfirot, which are also ten. But the hold is only on the seven of the main and seven of the sub spheres. That's forty-nine. And the zoyim can only block or occlude that. Cannot occlude all the spheres. The upper three are much too great for the sultan to have any kind of shlita, any kind of dominion over that, you see. So, so it's only when the 49. Pi- when the pipida yeah. happens, it's also in a sense that the, the, the klipa of the um, yisod that came into the mahu, that connection, the klipa fell up from that? Can you repeat that? Okay, when the picky die happens, didn't you say once that um, it's when the Yisod and the Machut come together? It's, it, Ferris joins Yisod, and they, those two then join Malchus. Okay, so is that a sign that the Klippa of those Sefirot broke? Yes. Or fell or diminished right, or whatever? Right, yeah. Actually, it's, uh, 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 it's this. Yisod joins with Malchus, because you saw it as Mashiach ben Yosef joins with Malchus, right, which is uh, Mashiach ben David, and then Tiferes joins with both, and Tiferes is a Shechina. That's the way it works, you see. So there's a release of ben, Dov- ben Yosef, then there's a release of Ben David, and then there's finally the release of the Shechina. Then what that means, the release of the Shechina, right, is... Uh, is uh, we understand what that means that God leaves the Klippa and he's now free you see and guess what that's why it says Ki in Tera. from Zion will issue forth the Torah without getting into it the Torah is uh, is a is the uh, configuration of all the spheres that's what the Torah really is in according to its Kabbalistic uh, meaning so what will happen is from Zion, what do you mean from Zion? From Zion because God is in Zion at the Kaisal. The day that the Shekhinah is released, what will happen is God will leave the Kaisal. It's amazing. And he will go into the city of Jerusalem. And that will produce unbelievable consciousness of the Torah, which is incredible enlightenment, Right? And because it's in Zion. God is in Zion, but he's at the Kaisal of Zion, you see. And he's going to, Kimitziyoin from Zion will emanate the Torah, right? And then he'll walk across, uh, which is, uh, it's interesting to picture this, he will walk across the plaza, the Shechina, will go across the plaza, and it's been released. And Torah will issue forth in an unbelievable wave of divine uh, power, you see, and then U Mushalayim, right, Kizimitsi and Tetze Torah, Udvar Hashem, and the word of God, Mushalayim, because he's going to go into Jerusalem, which is right next to the old city, come right into Jerusalem, right, and the word of God, which by the way is prophecy, Dvar Hashem, the word of God, will be in Jerusalem. So you actually see the redemption. Uh, you know, the removal of all the blockages of the Shekhinah. And that, the Gu'uva itself. You see, so that's what it alludes to when you think about it, you know. So when the Shekhinah leaves to bear it, that's the Zechira? Yes. When the Tiferes joins with the Yisoyed Malchus, right, that's the Zechira. Right. So the Pekidah is the release of the Messiahs, Ben Yosef, Ben David, and so on. And they get what's called the Yechid of Odom Harishan. The crown, the highest part of Odom Harishan, now joins Ben Yosef and Ben David. And they now have incredible amount of prophecy, connection to God, which we cannot even begin to imagine. 
right? And then the Shechina, which is the last to go. You know, that which is holiest is always the last to go, you see? And uh, then you'll have the goalless ending but for the Shechina itself, and God will rise from the creeper and go out, and then the Sultan is finished, you see? So you can just picture it, where the Shechina leaves the Kaisal, which is the goddess of the Shechina, actually goes into Jerusalem, right? And all of a sudden, the illumination and the enlightenment will begin from Jerusalem. But before that, the two Meshichan have to be released. You see. And then, you know, and that ushers in the whole messianic process. You see. Looking forward. Right. I have a question. Are... Yeah, oh, you're there. Okay, go ahead. Hi, Rabbi. Thank you. Sure. Um, sure, go ahead. You were saying about how you can feel the presence of the Shekhinah at the hotel. Yes, right. And I'm thinking, I'm wondering, how do we get that feeling to go all the way across to Gullah so that the non-religious Jews want to go? Like... The, so I'm, I, I didn't understand that. Say that again. How do we get what? A, a lot of people, like the environment that we live in right now is that it's so much inflation and everything happening in the world. People don't have money to go to Israel and other yes. people don't want to go because of Iran and people are like afraid. There, there's a lot of, like you said, blocks. Those are the blocks, right? Yeah. It's a tremendous Some of the blocks. blocks, right? Yeah. And, and maybe there's more kind, a lot more kinds of blocks, but how do we, like, what's going to happen if the Shekhinah is there, the presence? Isn't there a way to get Jews, like, to, to know that it's stronger now? So maybe more Jews will want to go now? Like, right now, if we go. The problem is, is the is enormous intensity of the blocks. That's what's the darkness. You know, you know, I, I, an airplane ticket to Israel. I don't, you know, maybe I don't know if you checked it lately. I can't believe it. United Airlines is charging twenty-three or twenty-four hundred dollars for an airplane ticket to Israel. Now, how many people can afford that? So, what we're seeing is the darkness is so extreme that you, you basically, many people cannot even afford a plane ticket to Israel. Now imagine if you want to take your kids, you know, you, your spouse, and, the, and your kids, who's going to come up with $10,000 to take the family to, uh, to, to go to Israel? So what's happening is that the availability even of some Kedusha in Eretz Israel, right, is, it's not even available. That's how bad the darkness is. Because like I told you, the, Avrida, the work today is not so much, although that's always present, but the major Avrida is don't sink into the quicksand. Don't. Like Moshe Rabbeinu said, Mi Lashem, who is to God? Eli, come to me. He's not even mentioning the uh, sin of the golden calf. You know? So that's the Avrida. So what God is doing is intensifying the blockage, the inability to be who you can be. That's the exile. So um, what I'm saying is that, you know, the inflation hits you hard. You can't afford many things. You can't afford to go to Israel, you know. And even if you got here, it's a fortune. The cost of living here is incredible, you know. And I'm not even going into the bureaucracy, the regulations of this country and so on how it's very difficult even here to survive, you see. Uh, but in any case, the main idea is that we are looking at incredible amount of darkness. These are blocks. This is the intensification before the end of the exile itself, you see. So the Tisha B'Av that we have now is much worse. The Tisha B'Av we have now is much worse. That's why I wanted to, uh, what do you call it, uh, emphasize. You know, imagine the guy, the guy says, 
well, I'm not a tzaddik, I'm not a, a Rosh Hashiva, whatever. Forget about that. You know, today at Tishba, we thank God I'm not thinking and becoming evil, you know, or narcissistic, or egomaniac, or I'm into pleasure. Thank God I'm not that. You've got to thank God for the fact that you're not thinking. That's what this Tishbov is all about. And that's the Tishbov of the end. That's what it is. You see?